hey, hey, everybody. What's going on? And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives. I'm Cam Hale. Joining me, as always, me amigo, Mr. Filio, Kyle Filson. How's it going, everybody? I hope everybody had a really good Christmas. Cam, did you have a good Christmas? I had an excellent Christmas. Had a really good time. The weather was beautiful down here for Christmas. But it didn't last long, right? I mean, we did not have a white Christmas, but two days later, we did. We're covered up in snow right now. Yeah, we've been living in the Wild West. We had some people lose their lives due to tornadoes the day after Christmas. It set us back with the show a day. Everything has been wiped out down here, folks. We have not had it. went from 79 degrees at 5 in the evening on Saturday to in low 50s in two hours and then when the warm air hits the cold air all hell breaks loose we had tornadoes the next day everything dropped down raining in the 30s get up the next day and there's six inches of snow on the ground and it's just been madness it's like the day after tomorrow down here folks so we're sorry for delays everything's been crazy we're good thanks to everybody for all the messages and the twitter messages and the emails <laughs> for checking on us we're good uh we were actually we're only maybe an hour or less from where those tornadoes hit. So it's close. We got some pretty wild winds. Like we said, the, the rain, the wind, everything was getting pretty hairy for a little while. But we're good. We pulled through. We had a great Christmas. I got a new fishing reel. I'm good I, to go. I got a new straight razor, like an antique Damascus Ooh. steel straight razor. Pretty Holla. cool. Yeah, man. I don't shave, but I do like that straight razor business. Yeah, that's true. You, you got to get you beard. one of those uh, those Japanese like stones. They're like, looks like a piece of slate. Or yeah. like sandstone, that you, you know, and then that's what you sharpen. Those are like the best. Yeah, those they things are expensive. You got to get one, man. Right? I've got a leather strop and everything. I, and I really have shaved myself a few times with a straight razor. Yeah. I'm not perfect at it. I'm not as good as the barber, but uh, I like to break it You got the, 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 the badger hair brush and yeah. the soaps and all that stuff. I don't know. Got... Like, look, I don't use that every day, but there is something cool and nostalgic about yes. having all that old stuff. Yes. I guess I kind of... I like to have it. Even if I don't use it, I could see it there. I got an old school like, check it. I can just <laughs> right. look at it. The like, stand with it's all yeah, sitting there. Got all it looks that. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me feel a little more manly. Well, hell, while we're talking about old stuff, let's get into some old stuff to kind of wrap up this year. That sounds good. We're going to talk about first the top 10 builds by the ancients that were exposed in 2015. Nice. This comes from Ancient Origins. And I'm going to start off with number 10. Number 10 is a burn reveals ancient stone effigies, kerns. And rock formations. Now, the U.S. government archaeologist decided to set a controlled fire back in April 2015 to reveal a site in northern Montana that has large Native American stone effigies, kerns, and circles and structures used centuries ago to drive cattle into catchment areas for slaughter. Now, these were previously unknown. And a couple weeks later, they sent up an aerial drone to photograph and record data about this ancient site. Officials called the 300-acre site. That's pretty huge, right? Yeah, that's pretty good size. They say other Plains Native American sites have separate effigies, kerns, and circles or drive lines used to direct buffalo, but this one they know is used for cattle. So that's pretty, pretty interesting. Number nine, moving on. Archaeologists excavate possible home of Mary Magdalene. Now, in August, a Catholic priest and archaeologist in Israel began excavating ancient an ancient synagogue there, and they think it could be the homeland of Mary Magdalene. Now, archaeologists say that Jesus could have preached in this exact temple as he was said to have spoken in synagogues in Galilee, and no other synagogue from his lifetime has been found. Now, the guy, Juan Solana, this is the Catholic priest, of course, he says that this synagogue that they found is ornate with frescoes, mosaic floors, and it has an altar called a bima in Hebrew in the center. Now, People are calling this stone the Magdala Stone, and there's a rare menorah carved into it. And archaeologists say that this one is one of the most important discoveries in Israel in the last 50 years. It says they also found a bowl dating back 2,000 years, and they're looking into it still. So who knows? Number eight, prehistoric fortress island. Now check this out, Cam. Archaeologists excavating a modern housing estate on the English-Welsh border and Monmouth, UK, discovered an ancient fortress consisting of a wooden island with a fortified farmhouse elevated above the ground on stilts. Now, this structure is used to stand above the waters of an Ice Age lake and may be older than Stonehenge or even the Egyptian pyramids. The structure, known as a cranog, has been dated to 4,900 years ago. Now, the cranog at Monmouth 
would probably have been occupied by a wealthy family who farmed the fields nearby and gathered fruits, nuts, wild cabbage, and medicinal herbs from the local woodlands. Now, this is pretty cool. To me, it looks like um, kind of like the structure in Waterworld the movie mm-hmm. with Kevin Costner, mm-hmm. but only a wooden version. Like it's just, it looks like it's on stilts in the middle of this lake. Pretty cool. Moving on, number seven, petroglyphs left in Canada by Scandinavians 3,000 years ago. Now, hundreds of petroglyphs are etched on a slab in crystalline limestone, about 180 by 100 feet in Petersboro, Canada. Now, this site is known to local natives as the Teaching Rocks, and their legends hold that it is the entrance to the spirit world. However, there is also a claim of Scandinavians creating these petroglyphs, which has new uh, a, a new group of supporters that are supporting that theory. They say that the depictions of the animals, their solar symbols, their geometric shapes, boats, and human figures of these so-called petroglyphs are in the same style as used in the old world. And for example, it features a large steering oar on the stern of one of the boats. And they're saying, well, Native Americans did not use boats like that. Now, of course, other people are saying that, well, the Native Americans, it's a depiction of a spirit ship. So it's not really a depiction of an actual boat they use. So there's people that are arguing over this, but very cool. I love it when they find these new uh, petroglyphs, you know, anywhere that Mm -hmm. show another culture that was here in the United States. Number six, mysterious stone circles of the Turpin Basin. I remember this. Approximately 200 mysterious stone circles dot the landscape in the hot and unforgiving Gobi Desert. And these are, they roughly believe, about 4,500 years old. They're man-made stone formations where they think that people used to do human sacrifices. But so far, they have not found any bones at any of these sites. Mm. Number five, a 4,000-year-old hidden tunnel discovered in ancient castle in Turkey. Now, excavations carried out at Gevel Castle in central Anatolia, Turkey, revealed a secret tunnel that had been built by the Hittites around 4,000 years ago. It's around 150 meters, or 492 feet of this tunnel, which have been closed off with a vault, have been investigated so far. This secret tunnel was used all the way through the Saluk era, and it establishes a connection with the outside of the castle, and it is closed with a vault and looks like part of the land. But when you go deeper, you understand that it's actually a tunnel. The first examples of secret tunnels go back to the Hittites, Excavations at Gaval Castle will resume again in May 2016. Number four, Pictish Fort, an Iron Age lookout post for sea raiders. Now, in the 5th or 6th century A.D., the Picts of the eastern Scotland coast set up a fort on the stone outcrop just offshore, possibly to hold sway over the seas. The ancient people had a reputation for their ferocity, and this is just one of the reasons why the Romans were never able to establish a lasting presence in what is now Scotland. Well, of course not. Those guys are mean, right? <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. The fort, the fort that was called the Sea Stack, may have been on one of a series of forts along the coast. So, pretty cool. Moving on, number three, 24 more ancient glyphs discovered in Nazca, Peru. I didn't know this. Researchers from the University of Yamagata in Japan spotted 24 previously unknown glyphs in Peru's famous Nazca Plateau. You're familiar with the Nazca lines, right? Mm -hmm. This is adding to that collection of hundreds of symbols and shapes that are carved out across the Nazca landscape. It is believed that the newly discovered glyphs are older than the hummingbird and the monkey symbols, which are two of the most famous of the Nazca lines. The glyphs are located 1.5 kilometers north of the town of Nazca on the southern coast of Peru. Most of them are heavily eroded, making their shapes very difficult to make out, although many appear to represent llamas and geometric shapes. They range in size from 5 meters to 20 meters in length. I guess that answers my question. I'm always like, well, how did they never see them? They don't seem like they're very big. 5 meters to 20 meters? Yeah, that doesn't seem very big. I'm thinking, when I think of the mask of lines, I'm thinking that these things are you know, hundreds mm-hmm. of feet long. Now these things are small. Number two, startling new evidence suggests Stonehenge was first built in Wales and then transported years later to England. Now, this is very interesting. Archaeologists found that the exact holes in a rocky outcrop in Wales from where the blue stones found at Stonehenge originated. Now, this means that they were quarried 500 years before 
and were assembled into the famous stone circle that stands today in Wiltshire, England. And then they were dismantled and then moved and erected in England Mm. at a later date. So that's crazy, right? Yeah, for sure. And they said that it might have taken them 500 years to get them from there, from Wales to where they're at in England, in Wiltshire. So they had people willing to spend their life doing nothing but moving stones. 140 miles or 225 kilometers is how far they moved them. Or they're wrong about the date and it was real easy and they just played flute music and it just floated them and they just right over there to it like a boss. <laughs> no? What? No? Like, like, a sing- bo- like a boss. Like a boss. Singing stones. <laughs> and then when they play music and they float them around like when they were talking about when they were building the pyramids. Okay, yeah. I'm yeah, with it's you. not 500 years. Come on. You can't trick people into dragging rock for 500 years. That's what. So you're you're doubting the archaeologist? I know it's a shocker, right? <laughs> yeah. So if that's true, man, that's that's shocking. Number one, legendary White Walls of Memphis. Whew, talk- I thought you were going to say White Walkers, like in the Game of Thrones. I'm like, that better not be real. <laughs> no. Now, according to Manthalo, an ancient Egyptian historian and priest of the third century BC, Memphis once carried the name Ineb Hedji meaning white walls. Now, some historians maintain that the city was named by the founder of Memphis, Pharaoh Menes, who built a fortress of white walls. Others suggest the city was named after the Pharaoh's palace, which would have been built of whitewashed brick. While another theory is that the white walls refer to the enormous walls around the Temple of Ta, the largest and most important temple in ancient Memphis. Bringing this story to fact, a team of Russian archaeologists unearthed parts of the legendary White Walls near the town of Miltriana, which is south of Cairo, near Saqqara, which was the necropolis of of Memphis. Now, speaking of the discovery, Antiquities Minister Mamadou al-Damadi said, We hope this finding will enhance our knowledge of one of the most important cities of ancient Egypt. Memphis played a significant political, religious, and economic role in the history of this country. So that is pretty cool, man. They've actually found this famed wall. They've actually found it. So that's pretty neat. I that's hope pretty they, awesome. You know, every year they keep discovering these new things, and I just, I, it gets my blood pumping. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. I love archaeology. I, I wish I was Indiana Jones. Right? <laughs> right. So I love those stories. Pretty cool. Dude, I love them. I love them. Anytime they just... It, it seems like it's growing. We always talk about it. And I know it's it's probably getting monotonous, but it does seem like it's getting to be more and more and more where we're finding more and more things. More and more people are questioning and going to look, really kind of digging it up. And I love that stuff. So thanks for that. That was really cool. Uh, I've been getting some 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 guff. Look, for all of our English listeners, man, I, I want to go over there to the big palace and watch the World Dart Championship, folks. I've been 180. Talking, 180. You see the way they go crazy when that happens? Dude, they they drink. They wear these crazy get-ups. They, I love playing darts. I've been watching it all the time, the dart championship. I didn't know it was multiple. It's going to be over this weekend. I've been watching this Van Gerwen Australians dude. Australians are really good at it, too. Are they? I watched this guy. Man, I can't think of his name. He had like a ponytail. This dude was a beast. I watched this dude from like the Netherlands, like Michael Van Gerwen, I believe is his name. Big, bald scary looking dude and he's just hammering 180s and then i think the the, the guy that's the, the defending world champion's last name's like taylor anyway this guy's awesome too anyway i look and i'm the ta- ta- i mean the, it looks like everybody at the event is having fun they're just drinking beer i want to know how come the guys on the stage throwing the darts aren't drinking the beer they do why do they just i just see them all drink water maybe they've changed the rule up or something i think it's bull crap i'd be drinking a pint while i'm throwing darts yeah i watched a 60 minute sports special uh on it uh, a year or so ago i'll have to find that oh yeah yeah. But they were talking about how a lot of the guys do drink while they're playing. I'm trying to think. A lot of them drink before the match even starts, like in the back, like in the green room or something. They start slamming pints. I would. Dude, I'm having a ball watching this. We're going to have to go over there for sure. What is it called? It's the William Hill, I believe it is. It, uh, that's what it is. Alexandria Palace there in London. It's the William Hill World Dark Championship. <laughs> when does this go down? It's been going on this whole time. It's on ESPN3. It's been going on all week. You can watch it all week. You can go back and watch it. Dude, I'm loving it. So my wife gets so aggravated at me watching it. Did you yell 180? Well, of course. Every time I made it, 180. I just, I love the whole thing. I can't help it. I get drawn in. Folks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to discuss something kind of interesting, I think. And I think everybody's going to enjoy it. So stick around. On the other end of this thing, we're going to have a little fun. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives.
All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed that little chit chat me and Kyle threw at you. Uh, I've been thinking about doing this for a while, and I guess you know what? It doesn't seem like it's any better time to do it than right now. And before we get into this whole deal, I got to set the stage, I guess. So I guess, Kyle, before we start this off, I need a little setting of the table, if you will, just to get us all in the mood or the right mindset for this story. I want you to picture this, Philly. Picture a beautiful snow covered mountain peak belonging to the highest mountain in the Armenian highlands and in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Now standing 16,854 feet, it is an impressive sight, and it wasn't documented as to being summited until 1829 when Frederick Parrott and Kakatur Obavian, accompanied by four others, made the first recorded ascent. Now, if you're asking yourself, this is what I'm going to be talking about today, is Mount Ararat. And it's here where today's story is going to take place, and we discuss what's come to be known to many conspiracy theorists and UFO researchers as the Ararat Anomaly. Ooh, I love this anomaly. <laughs> right? This is a great story. I love the story because it has a, a, a legendary story behind it. It has a biblical story mm -hmm. behind it. It has all these things. And... Uh, you know, I always wonder, is that what we're seeing? Is that is that could it be real? You know, it's it's interesting to contemplate. This. Well, I did a lot of digging, a lot of research in this whole thing, and I think it's going to be an interesting story that you're going to enjoy. I hope everybody enjoys. It. I know you're going to like this because it kind of comes it, it takes some crazy twists and turns that I wasn't even prepared for. You know, it's it's like we've always talked about. It's one of those things that you think, you know, something about it until you really go to digging in on it. And then you're like, ooh, maybe I didn't know near as much as I thought. So we're going to start this off with a little little storytelling. You got a picture, okay? On a nice morning on June seventeenth of nineteen forty nine, a crew from the U.S. Air Force quietly and smoothly took flight from a military base in Europe on a very secret mission, one so clandestine and dangerous that if shot down or captured, might have caused a possible war and surely would have caused their death. Their mission was this: to photograph and report what American intelligence deemed a disturbing amassing of Soviet military facilities and also weaponry along the border of Turkey. Now, the flight plan of this said mission would take them directly over Mount Ararat and it would not only change their lives, but the lives of the many who became embroiled in this strange yet fascinating tale. So the crew settled in at a height of 14,000 feet, ready to do the job they were sent out to do when the chief photographer caught sight of something. Instantly amazed at what he was looking at, he sat in shock as he saw what appeared to be an enormous and intelligently designed craft of some sort. Now, you got to picture that, Kyle. Imagine flying up there. Now, you're talking 49. Mm -hmm. You're flying up there. You have no idea. You know what I mean? It's probably never crossed their mind. You look down, you see something down there. Enormous. And you can tell it's not just, you know, just trash or just something. It's on this mountain. Now, it was no less than 500 feet long and possibly 600 feet long. It was partially protruding from the ice and the snowpack that covers the mountain's southwest face. Well, instantly I was like, huh, how would you know that size? But these men are trained observers. That's what these guys do. Right. I mean, they, that's why they, when you see the U-2 plane and the other spy planes back in the day, now, of course, they use satellites. But that's they were trained to take photographs, and then they were able to accurately you know, measure out. Scale things. Scale yeah. things, precisely. And right. So I'm sure they, they had scopes. Maybe they were looking out of things like that, too, that actually had scaling marks for distance. They would have known their height. They would have known the distance of where they're at. But now, okay, if you remember now, I said 14,000 feet. Mount Ararat is almost 17,000, so they're close. You know, they're lower than the peak of the mountain. Mm. So they're going through the mountains as to stay below any sort of radar. So they're right there by it. You can't only imagine, what are they going to be, a 1,000 foot above it when they see it? Right. You know, they're right on top of it. So you imagine this. The alerted crew, of course, was now buzzing with this excitement and also confused by what they saw. Now you can, you know, probably it's going nuts at the time. So they had the pilot, and he whipped the plane around, take a second pass. So that's got to be a big thing. He's like, look, let's turn this around. we got to go back and take a look. What was this? So you got to imagine the skill of this pilot in the ups and down drafts of these mountain ranges. 
whips this plane around and then they takes another pass the whole crew is on the other side looking to see if they could see it you know they're looking out there trying to find out and one of the crewmen shouted to all of his friends on there that he could see what looked like a very similar and equally large object not far away on the mountain's western slope so it looks like two objects or maybe it's broke something along those lines is what they see mm. Well, the pilot then, of course, turns his attention on this new mystery and all the guys on the crew, on the crew, they turn around and they start looking at the other side. Now, the western side, and they described it as the wing of an aircraft trapped in the ice and the snow. Now, they quickly took photographs and then reported all this. And then, of course, like all good conspiracy theories, these photos were slipped into a classified folder and vanished out of sight. But it wasn't really that long until they surfaced again. Three short years later, there was a man, a U.S. military man in Turkey by the name of Bill Todd. Now, he claims that he, too, saw this object on the mountain. And he also said it reminded him of a giant wing. Now, he says it was large, rectangular, and slate-colored. Well, that instantly got me to thinking, what if it was slate? What if it was just a big shelf of slate, you know, and that's yeah, all it right? was? What if yeah. that's this whole thing? Well, there in 1954 now, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Livingston became involved. Now, he was temporarily posted at the notorious Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Oh. And he was in the field office of the Topographic Engineering Center. And he worked in the primary office there at Fort Belvoir from 1948 to 1972. And he retired as chief of the field office. Now, I believe Fort Belvoir is actually in Virginia. Now, he was well past his retirement and in his late 80s when he came forward with what actually happened to him and his involvement with these photos. And he said on one morning in 1954, an Air Force captain that he did not know. And that was not odd because of the nature of his work. And he was dealing with all types of intel. This Air Force captain brought him a single photo that the captain reported was supplied to them from a U.S. attache at the Turkish embassy, and that this photo had been secured by the crew of a U.S. military recon plane. Now, Livingston said that he and his men were given, you ready, just an hour with this photograph. Really? And ordered to make an evaluation of this object and this object's dimensions. I so gotcha. doing that very thing, and after an hour of studying, the captain retrieves the photo thanked the men and left and was never seen by Livingston again. Now, Livingston went on to describe what he saw as an elongated rectangular object beneath a sheet of ice, and it had a dark outline and was of extraordinary size. So it lines up. But I would have thought this. If these guys are, you know, at the level that they are, you're given an hour. I'm picturing those guys. I don't know what that little piece of glass is. You know, they always look like they look on a map. And right, then you, yeah. you got your eye over it and you're sliding it around. I picture these guys doing that, you know, really going over it with magnifying glasses, really doing all they do. They don't have, like, the computers that we have now to run it through and to do all this breaking down. So I picture them by hand, physically studying this photograph. They would have been able to tell if it was a piece of slate, I would imagine. I don't know. Maybe a photograph would have tricked them, but maybe... Maybe not. Maybe. I would think so, right? You would think. You know, you would think that they'd have been like, okay, this is a naturally occurring thing. We've seen it. Well, one year later, in 1955, there was a French adventurer named Fernand Navarra. Now, he not only came in contact with this anomaly, but also came under the eye of the CIA. Now, there were some newly declassified CIA files, and in those files, they tell how Mr. Navarra came across a sizable piece of very old wood, which had clearly been fashioned by human hands. It was relatively close to where one of the photos from 1949 had been taken. But being just six years after the photos were taken and not being public information, this discovery made by Mr. Navarra, if it genuine, was made completely independently and without knowledge of the photographs. So, if he was on that mountain six years later and found all this, he didn't know anything about these photographs. Nobody knew. Right. And then he's found in that. Now, there's several interesting leads involved with this story, but we're going to jump forward to where it starts taking a weird turn. So there's a lot of time in between 19, 
1955 and 1974 that there's a lot of other strange things that happen that, that go on. And, and like I said, you can look into all that stuff. But here's where it starts getting a really wild turn. On August 6th, 1974, a fellow with a little clout gets involved in this. It's Congressman Bob Wilson. Now, Congressman Wilson approaches the CIA, and he asks if Dr. John Morris, now at the time, Dr. John Morris was the head of the Institution of Creation Research in San Diego, and he asked if Dr. Morris could have access to certain photos from Mount Ararat so as to help resolve the Noah's Ark controversy, Hmm. which makes me wonder how on earth did Bob Wilson, the congressman, know about these photos? Right. Yeah. You know, instantly Almost as like, if he was privy to it. Exactly. You're like, who's telling you about this? And then how did Dr. Morris know about it? Or did, did the congressman tell Dr. Morris? Because it sounds like Dr. Morris came to the congressman. I'm like, well, how did the congressman know? Where did he find this? Well, there's a CIA press spokesman at the time named Angus Thurmer. And knowing that this congressman had some inside intel... To even know that these photos existed, he admitted to Wilson that with respect to Noah's Ark, the CIA had already addressed this matter in some detail. And then he went on to say that they were unable to provide any help or info, period, and pretty much to F off. Really? Yeah. In in no certain terms, without really getting up, he's told him, just start (laughs) walking, buddy, because you ain't getting it. Right. You're done. Yeah. Which I was like, wow. The trouble is this, though, with this part. Congressman Wilson didn't bully so easy. Neither did his friends. You don't get to be a congressman by being weak. Right. So he's like, hmm. So Dr. Morris. You want to play hardball, Exactly. Yeah, that's how you want to be. All right. So Dr. Morris wrote Congressman Wilson again in January of 75. Okay? Right. Just to let him know that he had some new information on these photos. So somebody's telling Dr. Morris about these photos. And that also that he had found out some new ones had been recently taken as recently as 1974 by some U.S. intelligence. Now, in this research, it's unknown as to how Morris was getting his info or how he knew it had all been classified. But what is known is that even the second time Wilson asked the CIA that he was told these pictures did not exist. Which is very strange to me, knowing that just a year earlier, he was told the CIA had addressed this matter in detail. Right. Right. So that's, that's like I said, this is where it started getting strange. Now, here's something else a little wild. It's a strange little tidbit that also in 1974, the Mr. Navarra that I spoke of, he published his book called Noah's Ark, I Touched It. And during a little small book signing tour, if you will, basically going around and trying to get book sales up, Mr. Navarra set up his booth at the Iverson Mall in Washington, D.C., okay? Yeah. And on his table was a piece of wood that Fernand believed was an actual part of the Ark that he had received after what he said was smuggled into the U.S. for him, Mm. which is kind of strange. Yeah. But that isn't the strangest part. The strangest part is that there are CIA records that show that several analysis that worked for the National Photographic Interpretation Center, actually visited Navarra's display, but never revealed themselves to him or anybody else. Hmm. And it's also strange to note that in another foia CIA document from 1982, it states that this anomaly is referred to as the ARC problem. Really? Yeah. Now, how wild is that? So yeah, it start, how, do you, how do you explain that? If this is just a piece of wood and some crazy guy trying to make some money, why is the CIA checking up on this? And maybe that was why. Maybe they were checking up on what he had and what he knew, and that was it. You know what I'm saying? That I was did. all it was, and that's what they were there for. But there was a lot of analysis. Here's what's the, the strange thing about me. Why would you send a photo analysis person there to look at this, this interpretation, unless these people had already seen these photographs and they were wanting to see if what they analyzed in those photographs looked like what was on his table. Right. It's kind of what it seems it's like. It kind of seems like that's where it's going. Now, 1982 was a hot time for covering up these pics. Okay. Now, James Irwin is the pilot of Apollo 15's lunar module. Okay. Uh-huh. And who also allegedly walked on the moon, and he was somewhat obsessed with this matter. So he was a handful of only a handful of people that had ever been on the, on the moon. He's one of them. All right? Right. 
he was overly obsessed with this. So much so that starting in 1973, he led a series of expeditions to Mount Ararat searching for the Ark. And in 1982, he was badly injured on the mountain and he had to stop going up there. Okay. Now, during the downtime, he made a phone call to the home of a former employee of the NPIC. Okay. The National Photographic Interpretation Center. So he knew this fella, and his name was Mr. Dino Brugioni. Now, James Irwin, knowing that the NPIC would certainly have something to do with these photos and their studies, being who he worked for, who James worked for, he put Dino on the spot with some questions. Dino replied that the CIA never found any evidence for the existence of Noah's Ark, which is funny again because he never says that they didn't have any photos or evidence of something possibly otherworldly. He just says they never found any evidence of Noah's Ark. Right. That's what he come off with. Well, they're not necessarily saying it's Noah's Ark either. I mean, no, no, maybe, no, no. Maybe it's a really large ship. The reason they're saying it's Noah's Ark is because of Matt Ararat. That's, that's where right. it's all going. And then Navarra and the wood and all this stuff. But now, on March 14th of 1995, the Defense Intelligence Agency caught researchers on this whole topic completely off guard at the time. They de- declassified one of the photographs taken back in 1949. Now, this declassification is a result of one of the great Ararat anomaly researchers on this whole thing and basically the persistent digging into this subject and beating this dead horse over and over. And then the man I'm speaking of is Professor Porcher Taylor III. Mm. Now, he's a professor at the University of Richmond. Go Spiders. That's a little little college humor for Kyle. He, we're, we always love to look up <laughs> all the different... I guess, what are we calling them? What are they? uh, Mascots? All the mascots. We always look at the mascots because some of them have the best mascots. Some of the smaller colleges have the best mascots. These guys have some cool ones of the spiders. Spider beings would be better. There you go. Anyway, so Porcher gained interest in this subject back in 1973 because he was a cadet at West Point. Now, how he would have gained interest in that in 73, who knows how he come across that. Hmm. But the photo that was released was instantly prefaced from the DIA with this, and it says this, the anomaly is located along an unstable precipice near the edge of the permanent glacial ice cap atop Mount Ararat. The accumulated ice and snow along the precipice obviously fall down the side of the mountain at frequent intervals, often leaving long linear facades. It appears that the anomaly is one of these linear facades. Gotcha. So they think it's broken ice. Well, it seems like a lot of secrecy was used if it was simply that. Now, here's what was funny. The definition of facade. One is the front of a building or any face of a building given special architectural treatment. That's it. Or two, a false superficial or artificial appearance or effect. Well, it sure seems funny that they use that wording, right? That they throw all that together. It's just funny to me. But anyway, Professor Taylor wrote a 15-page paper on the subject titled The Origin of and Planned Search for the Mount Ararat Anomaly in Turkey. And he published that on January 9th of 1996. Now, in this paper, he gives a few little interesting backstories to this subject. Here's a few. It's in 1887, Prince John Joseph of Nori is to alleged to have found Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, and in 1893, stating his intention to organize an expedition to disassemble the Ark and reassemble it for exhibition at the Chicago's World Fair, he applied for a Turkish permit for such an endeavor. The government rejected his request. Mm. In 1916, several Turkish soldiers reportedly stumbled upon a large, damaged wooden ship, coincidentally in the general vicinity of the anomaly photographed by the Pentagon in the spy plane in 1949 aerial missions. And also in the summer of 1916, a large Russian military expedition supposedly examined the Ark after one of their pilots claimed to have discovered it accidentally while testing a new high-altitude engine. Now that's what the Professor Taylor came up with, too. Now, I would love to leave it all and leave everybody listening with these ideas of a mystery and a cover-up, but that's only half the story and the strangeness. You see, guys, 
Here is where it shifts from ancient history to ufology. Now, bear with me as we all stroll down this little uh, dark and cluttered path right now of where we're fixing to go. To start, we have to understand that there was a project in the care of the U.S. military intelligence known as Project Moon Dust. Now, it started back in the 1950s, strangely, right after Roswell and the photos from Mount Ararat. Mm. The office was based in Fort Belvoir in Virginia, the very same base where Lieutenant Colonel Robert Livingston was the chief of field office. Mm. And if you recall, he was stationed there from 1948 to 1972. It was then in 1954 that Lieutenant Colonel Robert Livingston was temporarily posted at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Yes. I see. I see. You see where we're going now. Now, After the reported Roswell recovery of aliens and their flying ship in July of 47, there's been a lot of stories and a lot of rumors of what? That it was all these artifacts was brought to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I got you. To the alleged, what is it called, Hangar 18? That's supposed to be believed there at Wright-Patterson. So... These threads are slowly starting to tie themselves together when you start looking at this. Now, back to Project Moondust. Its mandate was simple. It was to recover and exploit foreign and exotic technologies. Now, through declassified documents, it's been apparent that the main job of Project Moondust was to carefully capture and analyze crashed Soviet space satellites and rocket debris. But... According to our amigo, Mr. Nick Redfern, and his endless FOIA library, there's a November 1961 Air Force intelligence document pertaining to the activities of and guidelines for moon dust personnel, specifically at their base of operations in Fort Belvoir. And this is what it states, okay? I'm going to read this to you. It states this, in addition to their staff duty assignments, intelligent team personnel have peacetime duty functions in support of such Air Force projects as Moon Dust, Blue Fly, and UFO, and other AFCIN-directed quick reaction projects which require intelligent team operational capabilities. Now, that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful, yeah. Here's where we're going to start. The document also has this on it, all right? This is what it says. Unidentified flying object, UFO. Headquarters, U.S. Air Force, has established a program for investigation of reliable, reported, unidentified flying objects within the United States. Blue Fly, Operation Blue Fly, has been established to facilitate expeditious delivery to Foreign Technology Division of Moon Dust or other items of great technical interest. So what they are is they're basically a super-fast UPS They're there to get it and make sure it gets shipped. Moon dust, as a specialized aspect of its overall material exploration program, headquarters USAF has established Project Moon Dust to locate, recover, and deliver descended foreign space vehicles. So they're they're assuming that this is not Noah's Ark, but perhaps a crashed UFO. Well, it's funny that they're not saying any of that. But the paperwork but and the trail that, seems to start saying that. Okay, but they all seem to agree that there's something on Mount Ararat. Well, right? I mean, that's where all the... There's nobody agreeing on it. That just seems where things are pointing. But the CA wouldn't be interested in exactly. it if they thought it was just a big piece of ice. Exactly. You know what I mean? Or a piece of... Just a, a sloughed off piece of slate. Right. And why would you create all this? You understand... You, you see what I'm saying is they, they've, they've created a UFO. Something where they actually are going to do research into that. Blue Fly is a group that they are there to make sure that the delivery of foreign technological divisions basically get brought to moon dust. All the stuff of moon dust, it all gets they're there to help moon dust. And then moon dust is there to locate, recover and deliver descended foreign space vehicles. Now, you could easily read that as sat- spy satellites or any sort of satellite, any sort of crashed plane, any sort of crashed rocket, any of that stuff. That easily falls in there, but it also is one of those things that here's what I saw. Not to cut you off, here's what I saw. When you put that down on there, that looks good on paper whenever people are wanting to know where their money's going, tax money. 
You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like yeah. you can easily, yeah, all that stuff works great whenever you want to say, oh, that's what we're looking into for the Cold War and things. But it also looks really good whenever you're gathering up strange and foreign invaders and things of such yeah, but, coming down. So you're telling me we had a top secret uh, recovery team that was able to recover UFOs or whatever from any other country? I mean, how are we able to go into Turkey and take, you know what I mean? Why wouldn't well, Turkey take that? I'm I'm not so sure that Turkey wouldn't take that. That's what I'm saying is it seems like they are there to make sure that they're trying to be the first there. Before Turkey knows it's there, it seems like they're trying to be the ones to go. And like if something crashed, they want to be the first ones on there, grab it and get gone. Well, I know that they don't allow anybody to go to Mount Air right mm-hmm. now. I think in 1991 there were some people that were kidnapped by Kurdish rebels or something. Yeah, that's probably not. It's not a good spot to go hang out at around there. Not right that now. I would. No. Now, let me ask you. Now, this might sound dumb. Can I just get on Google Maps? google earth and find this i would think you probably could but i don't know how well you could zoom in maybe you couldn't i didn't even think to even look at any of that stuff (laughs) yeah right (laughs) yeah now here's the next step though in these strange clues and they come from a fella that nick talked to himself and this fella's name's don riggs now don's father harold was also a photographic analyzer at wright patterson and he told his son don these parts of the story that he had seen a file that referenced how project moon dust personnel began to take interest in the arc anomaly in the late 1960s. Harold also spoke of the seven black and white photos he saw that he said showed the arc very close on the mountain. And he went on to say that two of the pictures showed beyond any doubt a, here's what he says, very large, metallic-looking, rectangular object sticking partially out of the ice. No way was this wood. He went on to say that at some point around 1959, the U.S. sent a U-2 spy plane for more pics, but that they were immediately classified. Now, Don goes on to say this, that my dad said the pictures on their own didn't really answer much because of the mountain being inaccessible apart from planes, spy cameras, and satellites. No one was able then to get to the exact right place on foot to check it out, which is what you were talking about. Right. He went on to say that his father maintained that in the summer of 1975, a black op mission of Delta Force type guys was dispatched into the area one night and covertly dropped on the mountain. There they found their way to the site and photographed the object closely. Harold said he was giving access to these photos for analysis quite some time after seeing the first set of seven pictures. Now he goes on to say that he saw a report filed by the team leader, and sent to a group called Moondust. Now, Harold told Don that this object was extensively damaged, appeared to be very old, and was deeply embedded in the ice. That it was, you ready, vacant inside as if it had been trashed and was just a metal shell. Wow, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, Harold said that all these documents had a home at Wright-Patterson. And that that's where he had been when he received the photos for analysis. He also stated this, that everything he had received involving this had a moon dust stamp on it. Each and every page of info he received. Huh. And he did say that he was given absolutely no history or background on these pics that he was working with. Now, Don went on to state that his father was adamant that this was no big wooden boat or ark but that it looked like a metal device that crashed into the ice probably thousands of years ago. Ooh. Now I'm going to close with this, this little bit of info here. Now, Kyle and I have spoken before about Barry Goldwater, and he also pops up in this story also. Now, on September 1st, 1978, Goldwater wrote a letter to the then director of the CIA, Stansfield Turner. And it begins like this. It says, you may, want to th- you may think this is a screwball request, and it may be, but I would like to know if you can do anything about it. Now, Goldwater goes on to ask uh, about satellite photography, could, if it could be searched. And it says, to determine whether or not something in the way of an archaeological find might be located near or on top of Mount Ararat. Now, Goldwater explained to the director of the CIA at the time that he had received a letter. He says here, from a man in whom I have great confidence, who certainly is no nut, who knows Turkey rather well, but who feels that there is reason to believe the ark may be resting at or near the top of the mountain. I assure that I will keep this at any classification you want it kept. And if you desire me to go to the devil, I know the way. 
Hmm. Basically, if you want me to go to hell. Now, you remember he had asked about the alien ships and things at Wright-Patterson was basically told to go to hell. Right. That's where this comes from. Now, the CIA responded that it had no data on file suggesting the Ark of Noah had been identified or located anywhere on Mount Ararat or anywhere else. So that's pretty much that's the response that he got. Which is funny, like we talked, because General Curtis LeMay in the 60s was the one, you know, and, and he had gone back and forth. So I guess in closing, in this whole little story here, I'm going to leave you all with this. If there really is a wooden ship or ark atop Mount Ararat and the piece of wood that Fernand Navarra had was truly from it, or if this really is a huge alien craft stuck in the ice, trapped thousands and thousands of years ago, we'll never know. We don't know. There's no way for us to know, and I don't think we ever will because of the area that it's in. But what I can say is this. What we've learned from numerous ties and the lies that glue those ties together is a very fine conspiracy. Now, what we're talking about is Wright-Patterson, UFOs, classified documents, black op missions, and secret photographs. Right. That's what this whole thing has of it. There's small lines, and we always talk about these little small times and tales and how it all rolls into one. If it really is nothing more than a piece of slate and a, and a sharp ice edge, why on earth from 1949 all the way to the 1990s is this such a big deal? Why on earth is when you get FOIA documents even today, there's a lot of redacted stuff on this whole thing? But is it, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question that I can't answer. Well, we already know the U.S. was in Turkey when it probably shouldn't have been, when it was prodding around looking at Russia. All right. That yes. was, so we know that's what they were there for. Keeping eyes on each other. That's that's the whole thing. So it's no surprise that we were we were in Russia or in Turkey running around. So there would be no reason to hide that part of the story. If you were looking to redact it for any reason, why would you? Do, and I understand redacting somebody's name or something. I get that part. But to redact a lot of information from it, why would you? Unless there is definitely something up there. Now, you. First of all, it's this. It's not going to be like a, a military, a hidden military base. It's not going to be something along those lines. It's something that somebody saw and photographed, and they've either been there and can't remove it. They've got some photographs, got whatever off of it or out of it that they wanted to learn from, and have left it there because they know it can't be moved. It's too big without something massively being done, or they just they don't want to. They don't want to to admit to anybody about anything else that they found up there, whether it has to do with a religious background or a ufology background or both. I don't know, but there's definitely something going on. There's way too much information and way too much work put into that in order for that not to be something really up there. I agree, especially when you talk about it wasn't just one person. I mean, there's been numerous pilots and things that have seen it. Yes. Numerous people that have looked at these photographs and satellite imagery and things and say that they've seen it. And that it's not natural. It's something man-made that's up on top of that mountain. If it was nothing more than what we just said, slate or rock or broken ice or something like that, don't you think the first guy that, uh, that analyzed that photograph would have said, oh, this is all natural, don't need to worry about it. Why do they keep bringing these pictures back out? Why do they keep taking satellite photos? And why do they keep sending spy planes? It's not like it's cheap to send people up there. If indeed all of this is true. Yeah, you're if right. all of this is true, if indeed every bit of this is true. Now, we do know that they've researched. Those are FOIA documents that talk about these photographs and these declassified pictures and all this. Right. So we know they looked into it. If it's nothing more than a piece of rock, don't you think the very first time they analyzed it, they'd have been like, oh, hell, that's really nothing. And Throw why in their own documents is it, was that, what do they call it, the error rock problem or something? Yeah, yeah, the arc problem. The arc problem. Yeah. Yeah. What is going on? Something happened. Something's going on up there. Yeah. Man, that is interesting. I've been looking at the whole time you've been uh, talking about it. Yeah. I'm looking at these pictures. It's and, hard to tell in those black and white photographs, isn't it? It is. It is. I mean, I bet I'm, you know, there's several of them. Some of them are blurry. Some of them are better than others. And, uh, but it, I mean, there does appear to be something there. But I mean, there's stories where people said they saw like wooden beams sticking out. I, that, I haven't see, seen anything that looks like that. That's the first thing that, that's what got me drawn into it, was they were talking like they saw the rib cage or the hull of an old ship sticking out of their giant ship. And I'm like, you know what? I need, I want to see that. I want to see, the, I couldn't find those pictures. Now, you, yeah, you can find them, but you can tell they're Photoshopped yeah, right. or that they're doctored up. They're not the actual photographs. When you look at the actual black and white photographs, it looks more like nothing more than a straight line coming into that mountain somehow, like it is something that's broke off. 
but it would also be that way if it was like a big wing sticking out of there. Like I got to imagine a, a giant like spy plane or like here's my silly brain. The minute I got to reading and, and doing the research and thinking about this, it would be long straight edged if it was a black triangle. Right. right. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. what it would be. If a giant black, those like they saw over Arizona or whatnot, if that crashed into Mount Ararat, that's what it would look like. I'm thinking Sticking of the movie at like uh, The Thing with Kurt Russell oh, where they find that thing crashed yes. in the ice. Yes. So yeah. this thing's on top of Mount Ararat. It has snow and ice on it year round. It never thaws. But global warming maybe uh, help us out. Maybe it'll fall <laughs> some of that out and we'll be able to see be able it. To see it'll be it no more denying. Be able to see it, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Pretty crazy though, right? I don't know, man. It's just confusing. And like I said... I don't know which way to lead. I, I, I don't have any idea. I don't know any more about it now. It just except that there's a massive cover-up that went on with this. And that's pretty cool. I'll put some links in the show notes uh, where you can go over and take a look at these photos yourself. There's also numerous videos on YouTube. Uh, too many for me to list. But you can go in there and you know watch some of those and make up your own mind. Let's take a break. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Back with expanded perspectives. Thank you so much for bringing that to the light. I've heard about the air rat anomaly. I know we've talked about it in the past briefly, but never really dove into it. And I didn't realize, you know, about these supposed black op missions where people. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It always scratched my head. I'm like, I don't understand. Why is the CIA in another country, you know, digging up possible yeah. UFOs and stuff? But you know, apparently we didn't have permission. They just we kind of do what we want to do. Well, I got to take my hats like off to Mr. Nick Redfern. He is a beast at putting all that together. All the stuff he's done. I mean, he he knows a lot about that whole thing. So, I mean, it was with his help that, I mean, it. I, I learned a lot about the whole thing. And how did you translate it from German? Isn't your book in German? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did give me a copy of that book in German. Because he yeah. gave me one. Uh, I got a version of Keep Out in German. Yeah. Pretty cool. I just leave it in my car so people look and, man, he can read German. I know German. Yeah, you're right. Like, <laughs> if I got anybody coming over I want to impress, I leave that book laying out. I just open a page at random and throw a bookmark in it and close it. <laughs> and then I tell them, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, just because I've read the book numerous times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. That is funny. What was this you were telling me uh, about you've got some bad news for me? I got some bad news for you, for Lily, for several of our listeners. This comes from ScienceAlert.com, and, and, and this is going to make people weep. It says it looks... Like a worldwide coffee shortage is inevitable. Apparently, there's a problem, folks. No, I can't start my morning without coffee. <laughs> yeah, right. Here's the thing. It says the main problem is this. It's Brazil. It says while the country typically supplies 50 million bags per year, a severe and ongoing drought cut its coffee production by a whopping, you ready for this, 5 million bags last year. Wow. It says as as the South American nation produces one third of the world's coffee, any shortfall is going to be felt around the world. My coffee, I like Sumatran coffee, so I'm not worried about Brazil. You want that civet cat is what you like? <laughs> is that what you like? No, no, no. I saw you feeding that coffee to like the, the neighbor cats around here. Like you're trying to get them where you can gather that up from. I don't yeah, know if it works. Because I don't way. have a civet cat. So you I'll got a tabby. A, I use a I use a, <laughs> a house cat. Like a big orange, like Morris looking house cat. Right. I use Kyle's a calico. Got one. He catches, I got a calico. Like, Come on, it's got a poop. I got yeah. a calico over here. Well, apparently Vietnam also is like uh, uh, is the second biggest coffee supplier. So, like some Indonesia, Honduras, and Vietnam are oh, wow, also okay. from yeah. That's like so. There's it just look. I don't know that it's going to go like way down the tubes. I know this. It seems like in the last five years, coffee's really become the thing to be into. Starbucks. I blame Starbucks. But Dunkin' you, Donuts. I mean, it's but ridiculous. you know what I mean. 
Yeah. I mean, even even with that, that used to be that used to not be that. Where it's now is like everybody's like a coffee snob, and everybody they have their own. Of course, because you and I have some some coffee that comes from roasters here in Texas. I mean, different things like that. My wife got some coffee that's actually got pecans in it. Mm. It's roasted with the pecans, and then the pecans are in it. And when you grind it. You're supposed to to brew it with those pecans in it, and it gives like a, a a good pecan flavor. I don't like instant coffee. I don't use a Keurig or anything. I get real beans. I grind them, and I use a French press. If, That's the only way to drink it, in my opinion. Once you do that, if you've never done it, once you do that, it's hard to drink any other kind of coffee. Everything else takes and it's not like horrible. It's expensive. I mean, you no. can get a, a a French press for fifteen dollars. Fifteen bucks. You can get a good grinder for like fifteen or twenty. Yeah, and then you're you're ready to rock and roll. You're you're right though. It does make a huge difference. I mean, I. I remember drinking, you know, the Keurig and stuff at the office in the coffee room and stuff. I'm like, man, it's pretty good. It's convenient. It's fast. But yeah, yeah, man, once you get used to grinding your own, you'll. Pfft, there's no comparison. It's, right, it's yeah, it's a big. Especially so, good Sumatran coffee. Micah Hanks turned me onto that. He's like, "Have you ever tried this?" I was like, "No, you know, I never have." So I went to our local Central Market, uh, and they had some, and I bought it. And man, I'm telling you, it's strong. But boy, it'll put a little pep in your step. <laughs> and it's hard to go back to the other one. Well, you better start stocking up. But just like that, I wonder where it comes from. If it's Sumatra, maybe it comes from Sumatra. Is the price of coffee at Starbucks going to be like thirty dollars a cup? I mean, look, I like their coffee; it's pretty good. But I refuse to pay eight, nine dollars for a cup of coffee. I just refuse to. I've had some pretty good coffee. Though. I always think of like I've talked about when you get like a seven or eight dollar coffee at Starbucks. It's like that five dollar milkshake from Pulp Fiction. He's like, let me try that five dollar milkshake. <laughs> I ain't never had like one it, of those. Look, I think they're pretty good, but I just can't force myself to pay for that. It's ridiculous. I like to try all different kinds of, of the coffee. So, yeah. So, if you've got some folks that you really like, you may want to stock up right quick. I wonder I wonder if it's going to raise the price. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that's going to be affected with this whole thing. So, we'll just see. But they said that over the next, this is what they're, they're figuring out now, that these are industry experts say this, that regardless of what happens in Brazil, that they'll see higher, we will see higher prices and more competition for higher quality coffee. And then also, too, that they think that uh, the coffee production needs to rise by 40 to 50 million bags over the next 10 years just to keep up with the demand. That they think that with the 2015-16 output expecting to be, you ready, yeah. in the region of 150 million bags of coffee. we got too many people on this planet. Right? I do. <laughs> Drinking up your coffee. Yeah. It's, man, I hope that never happens. Yeah. Well, science will figure out a way. It'll get around it. Right? Yeah, exactly. Do you have anything planned for your New Year's? Yes, I do. Huge New Year's party. Oh, you do? Uh, yeah, I plan on being in bed by like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Oh, you won't be in bed that I early. don't go anywhere. You know that stuff. That's that, Like we said, that's amateur night. We don't go do anything. Folks, for everybody that, that that's going out, be safe. Please. Call somebody. Call an Uber. Y'all just take care of one another. Don't go out there and get all crazy. Like they always say, look, buzz driving is as bad as, as drunk driving. And it is. Everything gets jacked around and slowed down and slurred up and messed up we're not saying don't have fun just call a taxi yeah. man have somebody drive. yeah you know and if you want to do your friends a solid take their keys the designated driver you go out and get <laughs> blasted next weekend something like that or do the weekend after but you know take care of everybody while you're out there doing all that stuff we don't want to lose anybody over new year's and all that no not at all i'm looking forward to 2016 i think it's going to be a very interesting year for expanded perspective i think so 2016 we got some plans we've been working on that we're going to let everybody know about soon enough if you have any stories you would like to share with expanded perspectives uh you can email the show at expanded perspectives at yahoo.com you can also call the show 817-945-3828 you can tell us your story or you can just leave a quick note on why you like expanded perspectives and why others should be tuning in and you might find that replayed during one of our breaks i hope everybody has a good work week i hope everybody has a good new year's eve and uh we'll see you next year cam uh, yeah, everybody just take care, folks, and we will talk to you later. Peace.